Welcome to the 2023 VHA Shark Tank Competition. Hello everyone and welcome to the 2023 VHA Shark Tank Competition. I am your co-host, Danielle Hagen, and this is my partner in Shark Nanigans, Blaine Fitzgerald. Danielle, do I seriously have to wear this? You wanted flashy for our ninth Shark Tank competition, so I gave you flashy. And dare I say, so fishticated. <laughs> now, shake a dorsal fin, and let's get started. The ocean made me salty. This is the last year I let you pick our outfits. Seriously, Blaine, you look magnificent. My vision came to life. Speaking of vision, I hear we have the flounder of VHA Shark Tank here with us today. Really? Well, don't just stand there. Where is he? Dr. Elmahal, please come join us. <laughs> Let's hear it for Dr. Sharif El Nahal, the VA Undersecretary for Health. Do you guys hear me? All right, round of applause to Blake, Spud, Blaine, Danielle, and Amber. Appreciate all of these awesome folks. You're probably all thinking, well, what the hell is this guy doing up here again? Um, <laughs> But, you know, this event obviously means a lot to me. Uh, we did this the first time nine years ago, if you can believe it. And at that time, it was all based on a WebEx event. So it wasn't even in person. And folks were going through their promising practices on a PowerPoint. And the sharks were throwing up emojis and saying, hey, yeah, we want to invest in this. And we did it all electronically. But now we're here in DC doing it in person with an awesome judge panel and incredible sharks that are ready to judge these really promising practices. So round of applause to all the contestants, the judges, and the diffusion team. This will be a really great chance to showcase how value is already being delivered to veterans at the hands of frontline employees who do the right thing potentially when no one's looking, when they're not necessarily applying for funding before they get something done, when they're really just trying to use every avenue available to them to innovate and deliver great care, because that's why we're all here. And the places that have innovation specialists make that so much easier. And so another round of applause to innovation specialists and the Innovators Network. And I cannot wait to see a bunch of these presentations now. So thank you both and thank all of you for this awesome event. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Elna Hall, for swimming by. Please feel free to hang out while we hear from the rest of our finalists. I knew you had some fin up your sleeve this year. Yep, I am so ready to hear about the great reef of innovations our VHA colleagues have been working on. Well, let's get on with it. But before we dive into our finalist pitches, let's check in with our audience. Our fellow diffusion specialist, Amber Getchis, is out there somewhere. Oh, the puns are at high tide today. Amber, how's the energy out there? I'm having a whale of a time. I even see some familiar faces. I'm here with Kelly Jones, and her practice is improving communications and home-based primary care from our 2022 cohort. It's amazing to hear from our Diffusion Fellows. You were up on stage last year and selected as a promising practice. Tell us what you've been up to. Hi, Amber. Things are going very well. Um, our practice has <laughs> implemented, uh, has uh, completed implementation in um, Vision, nine, Vision 8, and we are um, continuing on uh, to Diffusion Academy 
uh, in the winter so that we can um, network with other practices and build a plan to replicate further. That sounds official. <laughs> it's great to hear from our Diffusion Fellows and the great work that they are doing out in the field. Thank you for swimming by, Kelly. Let's get back to the show. Thanks, Amber. There are some great opportunities that come with this competition. Hey, Blaine, did you know that the Diffusion of Excellence reeled in a whopping 355 applications this year? That's a 24% increase from last year. Wow, this competition just keeps getting better. It was a tough effort to narrow it down from 355 applications to 100 semifinalists, and now to our 15 finalists. This year, practices aligned with the Undersecretary for Health's six priorities for top-level strategic and operational advancements. Of those six priorities, five are represented today. Use the QR code on the screen or within the Whova app to learn more. Sounds like we're in for a treat. For those who are tuna-ing in for the first time, what can they expect to see today? Well, if folks haven't figured it out yet, sun's out, pun's out. <laughs> We've switched things up again this year. We'll still hear three-minute pitches from each of our 15 finalists, but we've grouped them based on VA healthcare priority. We also have a fresh shark panel to facilitate each round of Q&A. We've surfed the VHACs. Who are this year's sharks? The panel today is representative of the national, regional, and medical center leaders that bid resources before the competition in hopes a winning finalist chooses to replicate their practice at the director's facility. Who do we have on deck, Danielle? Well, first, we have Dr. Lindsay Rigler, the Director of Digital and Remote Health Center for Innovation to Impact and Innovation Specialist for Cincinnati VA Medical Center. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Stacy Williams, the Executive Director for VA Ileana Healthcare System. Our third panelist is Dr. Sabrina Clark. She is the director of the VA Center for Development and Civic Engagement in the office of the Assistant Undersecretary for Health and Operations. Before we get started, there's one more thing. We'll announce the finalists deemed promising practices at the end of today's competition. But we won't find out what bids they choose until tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, right back here in the auditorium. For our virtual audience, don't worry. That will also be live streamed. That's a fantastic idea for such a tough decision. The audience gets to vote for their favorite finalists too, right? Yes, they do. And voting is open now for Pitch of the Day using the QR code on screen or in the Whova app. Pitch of the Day is a chance for our in-person and virtual audience members to vote for their favorite finalist practice. Voting closes after the last group of pitches, so cast your vote. Shark my words, this is going to be the best VHA Shark Tank competition yet. Let's go to our first group of pitches, but first, shall we dance? You can't touch this. It's hammer head time! You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. I am loving the finalist ribbons. They already look like winners. Everyone is a winner today. Even if a finalist does not become a promising practice, the audience can reach out to them directly on Diffusion Marketplace to facilitate implementation after today's competition. Danielle, take it away. The practices in this first round represent two of the six VA priorities, connecting veterans to soonest and best care, which incorporates the use of technology into the veteran healthcare experience. The second priority is this group is serve veterans with military environmental exposures, which honors the promise to address comprehensive exposures, or PECDOCT. Let's introduce our first finalist, Dr. Bondi from Pittsburgh VA Healthcare System presenting Elegant DM2, Early Intervention Addressing Therapeutic Inertia in Diabetes Mellitus II. Hello, Sharks. 
Are you here because you know that diabetes is a huge problem and you're looking for an elegant solution? Are you here because you know that delay in treatment can increase the clinical burden and economic burden? Uh, two and a half times more prevalence and most of the burden falls on primary care doctors. So it is to the tune of $7 billion and 14,000 life years lost in a study that looked at 13 million people where the treatment was delayed only by one year. So why even worry about it? Well, traditionally, most of the patients get their care with primary care docs. So when the, the going gets tough, they get sent to an endocrinologist. Just 16% actually make it to the endocrinologist. And then eventually when they do, they get their care if they go there. But not so with Elegant. So let me just share a small story with you. It's small, but it's very impactful. Peter was transferring his care to VA, VA to a CPAC clinic because he couldn't afford, afford the care, the cost of the care. 48-year-old man, veteran, a nurse, working 40 to 60 hours a week, caring for others, doesn't have time for himself. He's never had good control of his diabetes. So when he transferred his care, he met Elegant, an Elegant solution. The pharmacist, who is the core pillar of our program, reached out to the endocrinologist virtually through the collaborative program. And there, the specialist, after an in-depth review, gave her recommendation, and as a result, Peter was on his way to a good control. Fast forward, a year later, he is using continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump, and he has best control he has ever had. So, it's not just Peter. 700 veterans, 6,500 square miles, and now this program is being implemented at Iowa Medical Center. And patients traveled almost zero miles. We did this by providing the right medications to the right veterans at the right time. You know, you've heard about Ozempic and Jardians, the newer medications that have been transforming patients' life. I tell my patients it's been transforming my life as an endocrinologist because I'm, for the first time, I'm actually able to help them saving their lives, improving quality of their lives and their family members. Less heart failures, less dialysis, less transplant. So the, um, our, our mission really here is to intervene early, to break the barriers that patients encounter, build the collaborative teams, and get them the treatment right time. So Elegant is your answer to break the silos, build the bridges, get your patients timely care, when they need it, for what they need it. So sharks, are you ready to swim with me and take a bite out of this giant of a diabetes? Thank you. We are starting out strong this year. Our second finalist is the class clownfish, Dr. Stephen Graham from Pittsburgh VA Healthcare System to tell us more about the virtual waiting room. Thank you, and hello. We're very excited to share the virtual waiting room with you. We love it, we think you will too. So what is the virtual waiting room? Let me start off by telling you the story of Portia, the patriotic poodle. Like many during the pandemic, Portia got as sick as a dog and needed to see her vet. So I took her in, she got examined. When she was done, I spoke with the vet on the phone. Portia needed some antibiotics for a couple weeks and then the follow-up at two weeks. Okay, great. Take Portia home, get my groceries, go back to work, do laundry, go on with life. Except, wait, wasn't Portia supposed to have a follow-up appointment? In all of my rush to get on with life, I never called the front desk to schedule Portia's appointment. When I finally get in touch with them a week and a half later, all the appointments at two weeks are gone. Oh no, Portia's care is delayed. Does that sound familiar? Did I leave out the obnoxious hours our MSAs and veterans spend playing phone tags, scheduling follow-ups after their virtual care? What Portia needed, what your veterans need, is a virtual waiting room. With virtual waiting room, after the clinical aspects of our virtual encounters are done, we invite the MSA to join us right in VVC and schedule the veterans follow-up right then and there. It's simple, it's easy, it works. Veterans love it, they tell us seeing the MSA's smiling face feels just like an in-person appointment. Our MSAs love it, because they don't have to spend hours playing phone tag trying to get the veterans scheduled. 
and our physicians love it because we can see our veterans when we need to see them. So Steve, that sounds great. Can you prove it? Here's some data from earlier this year. You can see we have two psychiatrists in the burnt orange using our standard telephone tag scheduling, two psychiatrists in the lime green using the virtual waiting room. With the virtual waiting room, we get nearly 60% of our veterans rescheduled for their next appointment on the same day of their current appointment. That saves the MSA so many hours. At the same time, with standard telephone tag, nearly 10% of our veterans still have open return to clinic orders. Those are veterans who aren't getting scheduled for care. Virtual waiting room connects veterans with the best care. Also, by scheduling our veterans right away, we get those veterans seen sooner. Simply by implementing the virtual waiting room, one of our psychiatrists had a nearly six whole day decrease in the average time past the clinically indicated date their veterans were scheduled for their follow-up on average. That same psychiatrist had a 30% increase in the number of veterans that were scheduled on or before the clinically indicated date. With virtual waiting room, poor should get seen at two weeks, not three, not four. Virtual waiting room connects your veterans with the best care, and they get that care on time. Thank you. Feel free to check out our uh, any questions. <laughs> Next, we have Supporting Community Outpatient Urgent Care and Telehealth Services, or SCOUTS, from Dr. Colleen McQuowan, all the way from Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center. Oh, <laughs> all right, SCOUTS. Imagine that you're an emergency medicine physician. A woman brings in her father, 75-year-old Mr. O. She thinks he needs to be admitted and placed into a nursing home. She doesn't think he's safe at home anymore. He's falling. Last week, he was on the floor for two hours before anyone found him. He's not bathing anymore because he's scared to get into the bathtub. He's skipping meals because sometimes he's too tired to eat. His medications are disorganized. So it's easy. We admit him, put him in a nursing home. But there's a better way. How about instead, we do a scout's visit? supporting community, outpatient, urgent care, and telehealth services. So an ICT, based out of the emergency department, goes out to his home. She does, while she's there, she does home safety checks. She does screens for fall risks and geriatric syndromes. And then she videos back to the ED doctor. Now the ED doctor does a virtual visit with the patient in his home. The ED doctor can see how Mr. O is doing since he left the emergency department. She can see how his medications are organized. She can even see what those fall risks are. And then all together with the daughter, they come up with a care plan. They refer the patient to um, VA social work to talk about ways he can get food delivered to his home. They get durable medical equipment that can prevent him from falling. A life alert button in case he falls, he can press that button and get help. A pill organizer. And the daughter's connected with um, caregiver support programs to support her needs. So how are we doing since we started Scouts? We've seen more than 1,600 veterans. We've significantly decreased inpatient admissions and ED revisit rates in this very vulnerable patient population. And our patients are seven times more likely to use telehealth in the one year following their Scouts visit than if they didn't. We also give out hundreds of pieces of durable medical equipment and identified hundreds of social determinants of health that are actionable. And our patients like it. We are providing veteran-centered care and supporting veteran caregivers. But why should you choose Scouts? Is it because we save $4.5 million in avoidable hospital costs over the first few years of our program? Is it because we saved hundreds of hospital bed days that could be opened up for community admissions to be transferred to the VA where we know they get better care? Is it because we have awesome patient satisfaction rates? No, it's because we save lives. This is a quote from one of our veterans, Mr. N, whose story was featured in VA um, Insider this month. I would like to thank the VA and all of their exceptional staff for all of the services they have provided to me. The Scouts program literally saved my life. Thank you. Swimming right along to our director's pick and last finalist for the Connecting Veterans to Soonest and Best Care Priority, we have Joseph R. Johnson IV, 
from Kansas City VA Medical Center, presenting Leveraging Alteryx Designer against VA Health Connect Data. Hello, my name is Joe Johnson. How many of you use data to leverage, or leverage data to produce outcomes? This practice takes leveraging Alteryx Designer against VA Health Connect data. How many of you have to deal with messy spreadsheets? Currently, most of us have to use spreadsheets that are conjected to complicated, complex data that's hard to read. It takes 40 hours with this practice. It took 40 hours at a rough cost of $28,000 to compile, format, manipulate, and get it ready. But what if? What if I told you that there was a way to take that four months at a cost of nearly $28,000 and do the same thing in 40 hours at a rough cost of $1,700? And on top of that, you get immediate insights for action. Alteryx Auto Insights. It takes and is automating the cleanup process for call center data. On top of that, it leverages AI in order to find the best insights. As we see here on the screen, it's looking at an average abandon per day. In this particular case, it decreased by 34,000 out of a change. Now, this is just a screenshot and is not completely accurate, but the official product is completely customizable. Value applies to any data, any problem, at any level. Saves time. That is the biggest, number one value of this practice. Automates manual processes. Generates usable information quickly for wider use. Improves efficiency and reduces operational costs. Speed to insights to improve the veteran's experience. That's what we're all about. Leveraging Alteryx Designer and Alteryx Auto Insights against any data, identify any problem, and apply to any organizational level. Could your facility use a real-time storyboard to identify VA, call, con, VA Health Connect call center data. Are you ready to improve the results you get with your data? If so, please hit the QR code, see, my, see our practice, and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Our last finalist for this round, aligning with the Serve Veterans with Military Environmental Exposures priority, is Mark Groner presenting Military Environmental Exposure Non-Registry Template. He comes to us from Dayton VA Medical Center. I want to tell you all a story. Veteran Smith goes to his local VA medical center to see his primary care doctor. During his toxic exposure screening, TES, he states respiratory concerns during his time around burn pits while serving in Kosovo. He's informed Kosovo doesn't qualify for anything. This leaves him feeling dismissed and that just because he did not serve in a certain area at a certain time, his health conditions and exposures are of no concern to the VA. With the signing of the PACT Act, all VA medical centers are required to do a TES on all enrolled veterans. National TES data shows us that approximately 25% of all enrolled veterans endorse some type of toxic exposure concern, do not qualify for a formal congressional registry. Those veterans are highlighted in the violet and green areas here. That's approximately one out of every 10 enrolled veterans. 
the VA had no method to properly document and address these exposure concerns. My team created a non-registry toxic exposure template. With this, clinicians are able to address and document all exposure types of veterans in a standard formalized format. So what's the process? It documents and addresses the veterans' ex um, concerns. And I want to iterate, a terminally ill veteran, he had one of our um, exposure registries. He served at Camp Lejeune. He was educated on Camp Lejeune, the contaminated water, assessed for possible health conditions, educated on the process to properly file and obtain benefits. And then it was through this process, he was able to actually obtain those benefits that he is so entitled to. So who all benefits? First and foremost is a veteran. They have a veteran-centric experience. They are educated on their exposure. And they are heard. Medical centers benefit. They have a veteran-centric experience as well. They increase VERA dollars, it increases and encourages enrollment. And then third party stakeholders. All you need are two things, two of which every VA medical center has. An electronic health record, a clinician administrative staff, you just need to create the non-registry clinic. Our process is a project that, or our project is a process that implements the entire intent of the promise to address comprehensive toxins, the PACT Act. So I ask you, Sharks, which experience do you want for your veterans at your medical center? Thank you. What a phenomenal job. Let's hear it for our first five finalists as they come back up to swim with the Sharks. All right, Sharks, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Bond, for your presentation. I really enjoyed listening to your pitch. Diabetes is certainly a very well-documented and very severe problem here with our nation's veterans. How do you envision incorporating existing diabetes dashboard and information into your existing workflow? Thank you for that question. Actually, the diabetes dashboard is the fuel behind, behind our approach. We pick patients from that because the dashboard is a rich data source. It tells us what cohort is there that needs help, whether it's um, poor control diabetes or certain medications. So pet pharmacists actually are well trained on that. All they need is the support to really be brave and be able to implement those. You know, I just want to share one small thing. I, when I see patients at the late stage of the disease, I feel like I'm on a Titanic deck and I'm just moving the chairs. And I feel sad. I feel like I should have met you before. So I want to meet them on a cruise ship. But they is sunny. We can take good care of them. And pharmacists and endocrinologists, when they partner uh, virtually and collaborate, we can really lift the boat and help larger population. I love the opportunity to expand that program to include other specialty care services that impact diabetes care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as a follow-up question, and just know that I also am a pharmacist, and so I have the interest in how you partner, but I'm also interested in the veteran satisfaction data as well. Have you collected veteran satisfaction data with this program, and what does it tell you? Yeah, so we've been so busy taking care of them that we were not collecting that part of the data, but we get cards from the patients. One patient just said, how do you just do this? How have you done such good care for us? You know, they, when they have get, gotten care with pharmacists, and if the need be so, and they need to see me, they say, no, work with my pharmacist. I'm not traveling 30, 40, 50 miles to see you. Can you see me? So we incorporate telehealth. Um, so you know, the increased number of the patients and the participating pharmacist tells us that this is a scalable and sustainable program. Thank you. Thank you. Great to hear you all. And Dr. Graham, I want to shift over to you for a moment, if you don't mind, and loved hearing about the, the virtual waiting room. My question is about this, the time. Mm -hmm. In thinking about the length of time 
with a patient, yeah. does, will that increase the time per patient? Is the physician staying along with that uh, support team in the room with them? And do you see any concerns about the time between patients as you see them? Sure. So, sometimes. Sometimes I will stay in the room with the veteran until the MSA is logged in and, and do a warm handoff, particularly if there's something complicated or very particular with when I need to see the patient back. And I'll communicate that directly to the, to the MSA. Sometimes some of our psychiatrists will have to move on to their next patient and you know, they leave and ask the veteran to wait in the room while the MSA comes on. Usually it's just a couple minutes. Um, both seem to work work wonderfully. Um, you know, the other times if I'm in there with the veteran still and the MSA hasn't logged in, I'll just mute myself and let the veteran, well, I let the veteran know first that I'm going to work on some of my documentation, some of my notes, but I'll still be here if they have questions until the MSA logs in. You know, so this way I'm getting my stuff done during that downtime. Understood. And glad to hear that Portia got her care too. She did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Graham, for your pitch. It's interesting because as clinicians, when the pandemic hit, we had to shift quite quickly, yes. right? And the standard workflow for an in-person visit was not replicated in virtual care. So I thank you for identifying a problem and solving it. My question to you is, how, what does your workflow look like? When you're finished with your appointment, are you using Teams message to ping your AMSA? How does that work behind the scenes? Yeah, so we have a Teams chat set up for all of our psychiatrists using the virtual waiting room. Um, and then the MSAs who are doing the scheduling. So we'll just, as soon as we're ready for the MSA, as soon as we've entered the return to clinic order, we just type something in the Teams chat, you know, with the link to the virtual waiting room, last name, last four, MSA starts pulling them up while they come on in. It's seamless. I also, not to your question, I say psychiatrists because we've developed this in behavioral health. We think it probably could be used in just about any type of specialty. Um, but as a psychiatrist, I talk about psychiatrists. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, Dr. McGowan, moving on. I'm very excited to hear your presentation on scouts, but talk to me as to how this works with a less complex facility that doesn't have all of the resources that you see in facilities with EDs. Sure. So we have 111 or 110 VA emergency departments, and almost 80 of them are now engaged in geriatric emergency medicine programming. And so they're already thinking about how to serve their vulnerable older adults and how to identify those who need extra help. Because we know not everyone. My dad goes golfing every day. He's a veteran. He probably doesn't need someone to come see him in his home. All right? But since we're already identifying these high-risk patients and we have many of our emergency departments, especially our higher um, 1A facilities, I know not all of them are, are 1A, um, that have many ICT. So intermediate care technicians or former military medics that bring that background to us and they, our patients love the veteran-to-veteran -veteran connection. But we're actually expanding into uh, rural areas right now. So Officer Rural Health is helping us expand into 10 rural VAs to serve our rural patients. And so we, we really um, try to lever leverage all of the help. You know, we're going out and scouting out the patients that need extra help. And so we can say, this patient needs to talk to their packed social worker. This patient needs to talk to their packed pharmacist. This is the message we can send to their packed RN. And so we're trying to get between emergency medicine and the primary care teams, we're trying to leverage the staff that we already have to be able to serve the patients and get their care to them faster. Thank you. And I am so glad to hear you mention the, the rural facilities. I ha had the chance to be an acting medical center and director in, in Saginaw, where the facilities are not close to one another. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad to hear you say that rural health is involved, but I'd like to hear more about that. And what are the limitations? Because between the primary facility and the outpatient clinic, sometimes we're three hours yep. from that location. So well, tell me more about Well, that. and that's the great thing is the ICTs, when they are assigned to a scout shift, they have the time to do that individualized care for the patient. So we had a case in um, Palo Alto. Palo Alto doesn't seem like a rural place, but they get veterans from a large catchment area. So the ICTs went out to see this veteran. He had been in the emergency department, knew Foley catheter, never had a Foley catheter before for urinary retention. And they said, okay, come back next week and learn more about the Foley catheter and bring your wife with you. So the ICTs went out to his home. It was a two hour drive to get there. The last 10 miles were on a dirt road. 
And so they went out there, they were able to teach his wife about how to care for his Foley catheter, and they said, you know, we're having trouble getting our appointment. While they were there, the um, ED physician messaged the um, primary care team and the urology team, which both called to schedule follow-up appointments for the patient. And so right there, this vulnerable older adult was able to stay in his home while we sent the, the ICT, that military medic, out to his home to scout out the situation. Thanks so much. Joe Johnson, representing and leveraging Altrix Designer against VA Health Connect data. One of the great things we have in, in VA is access to data. One of the yeah. bad things we have access to in VA is data and understanding okay. how we use that data in a very meaningful way. Thank you for identifying a solution that displays that data in a way that improves the veteran's experience and reduces call times. Thank you. All right, fantastic. So just a brief question for you. What team brought this to the, your medical center? What was the team composition? It was while I was working for the Visentin VA Health Connect Clinical Contact Center. And there's a noticeable siloed event going on in the data. They had it siloed between what they called the queues, since it's a call center, and the agents. And so part of what I was doing to answer a question on my supervisor was finding which reports contained what information I needed and then literally exporting all of those appoint appointments for four months and combining them in an Excel spreadsheet which was the four months. However, once I got a hold of Alteryx Designer, I was able to do everything, the manipulating and everything else, with a lot of help from Alteryx in, in 40 hours. And it automated the entire process. Thank you. You're welcome. I know we have very little time left, but you cannot get off the hook and not get a question when all of them did. So Mark, <laughs> that just wouldn't be fair, would it? So let me ask you, just what drove the desire? What I'm hearing when I heard your pitch was that here are veterans signing up or the coming in for PACT Act, and then there are those who are told, okay, you're not eligible. And so finding a way to really give them value and their lived experience in the military count. Tell me more about what drove you to this point. It was, and was that really it, or is there more? So um, we were looking within Vision 10, my team, of trying to implement something like this uh, actually a couple years ago. However, because of Cerner at the time coming on board, no new projects or resources were being put onto into CPRS. Well, with the signing of the PACT Act and then the delay in the rollout of Cerner, we were able to kind of use that motivation and all the attention of the PACT Act to then justify doing this. Um, you know, Camp Lejeune, single, the most common one that there is no actual registry to capture all that data for veterans um, as a result of the contaminated water. And that's what really was uh, sparking the need for this. But then we just got onto the tailcoats of the PACT Act and that helped. And then with the toxic exposure screening, that really put into numbers just how much that need was. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mark, thank you for your pitch and go visit 10. Back to you, awesome. Daniel. Yep. Thanks. Wow, excellent pitches from our finalists and some great follow-up conversation with our Shark panel. Don't forget to use the QR code on screen to begin voting for your favorite finalists to win pitch of the day. Shrimply amazing. I want to hear what folks in the audience are up to after that first round. Amber, what are they saying? Are you squidding me? That was great. These innovations are sure to improve veteran care. I'm here with Angie Barnes, and this is her first VHA Shark Tank competition. Woo! What are you excited about so far? Well... With all the great pitches that we've heard so far, I can't wait to see what moves forward. Yes, they are doing sharktastic work. You can check out their Diffusion Marketplace pages to learn even more about their innovations that are presented today and even contact the presenters to work with them. 
In the meantime, let's get back to the tank. Thanks, Amber. Regional and local leaders can reach out to any finalist directly through their Diffusion Marketplace page. Looks like our second round of finalists are ready to go. The next five practices align with the priority to accelerate VA's journey to a high reliability organization. From VA Bronx Healthcare System, we have Dr. Kirsten Vest presenting Surviving Sepsis 90 Campaign, HRO Saves Lives. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to talk to you about sepsis, I promise. But first, I have to tell you what it was like to be a healthcare worker in New York City during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. To put it simply, it was devastating. Riding the subway alone, walking down empty streets, then finally getting to work only to see refrigerated trucks in front of the hospital and knowing what they were for. Hearing that our ICU was completely full and there were more veterans in the ER on ventilators waiting for beds. These were dark times for us and our patients. We came to work every day, tried our best, and we just couldn't seem to do anything right to get our patients better. Two years later, we finally had therapies proven to reduce hospitalization and death from COVID-19, and we could see the light at the end of the tunnel. So why am I comparing COVID to sepsis? Sepsis, this life-threatening, dysregulated host response to an infection, a condition that accounts for one-third of hospital deaths and can affect anyone. Well, unlike COVID-19 during the first wave, we know how to manage patients with sepsis with protocol-driven, goal-oriented guidance for resuscitation within the first six hours. We have guidelines that, if followed, are shown to save people's lives. Every year, approximately 1.7 million Americans will be hospitalized with sepsis, and 20% die or are discharged to hospice. So why did only 14% of patients with sepsis receive appropriate early management at the Bronx VA in fiscal year 22, according to the SEP90 sale metric? And how did we end fiscal year 23 with 67% of those patients passing SEP90? I'll tell you, by creating a standardized approach to recognition, evaluation, and treatment of sepsis and septic shock at our institution. We established an interdisciplinary team that created, number one, a standard process to screen for sepsis in the emergency room, two, tailorable order sets for the management of sepsis, and three, templated notes to document sepsis diagnosis and treatment interventions to ensure effective handoffs. We're recognizing sepsis earlier, and we're more consistently implementing the early management bundle for our veterans. But the real driving force behind our improvement in CEP90 is our standardized documentation. Our teams are finally getting credit for the life-saving care we're giving our veterans. Right now, some of you may say that we're just fixing a metric, and others may be wondering if passing CEP90 really improves patient outcomes. Well, we know that protocolized sepsis care reduces mortality, and I hope you'll consider implementing our practice at your site. Thank you, and thank you to all frontline staff taking care of veterans with sepsis. Our pitches so far have my in dolphins going. The next finalist is Pathology Best Practice Sorting Methodology, being presented by Dr. Fadi Vidora from Orlando VA Medical Center, Lake Nona. Good afternoon, Sharks. My name is Fadi Vidora. I will be presenting the Pathology Best Practice Sorting Methodology. Among the different types of errors that can be made by pathologists, a mix-up of slides between cases and the misfiling incomplete cases continue to contribute to wrongful and to delayed diagnosis. Measures to completely avoid these type of errors do not exist, and this is where the problem lies. The major aggravating factors is the current gold standard for sorting slides, where the pathologist desktop serves as the central hub for all the incoming slides to be read, slides that are held for further studies, and slides that are ready to be filed as uh, complete. Worse, slides belonging to more than one veteran are frequently placed in the same folder. You could add to this the constant pressure to be timely, and the frequent daily interruption for conferences, consultations, and calls from your friends and wives. Essentially, 
There is a total lack of a standardized organization system for sorting slides with no redundancy for safety. Last year, our department experienced a mix-up of slides between a benign and a malignant cases that led to serious harm to a veteran. We estimate the prevalence of such errors to be around 1 in 3,800 patients and that of misfiling incomplete cases around 1 in 400 cases, which are totally unacceptable high in error rates. We address these problems by kind of improvising a novel and standardized sorting methodology that shifts the central hub from the pathologist's desktop to wall-mounted, fully customizable bins. We adopted bins of six colors, each with a different color, each with a different uh, label, I mean, conforming to our needs. By this virtue, I mean, only one case at a time is allowed to be on the desktop next to the microscope with a zero chance of a mix-up. In addition, Zero chance of misfiling incomplete cases since slide folders placed in bins provide a powerful visual reminder to complete the case before it's filed. This practice that also facilitated the delivery and pickup of slides by these two technologies is non-costly and easy to implement within a matter of one to two weeks. For over a year now, our department has enjoyed 100% error-free conditions with improved proficiency and satisfaction and much better utilization of space. A conservative estimate of cost avoidance of claims for such errors is around $1.3 million a year. Charles, I urge you to have this practice with zero heart commitment implemented in all the partners of pathology. We do not to wait for a single event to happen. It is super practical and has received the best practice award by the National Focus Office of Lake Pathology and the Joint Commission. So just go for it with a big bite. Finally, a special thanks for the tremendous efforts of Dr. Ben Wanko and Dr. Ming Jonathan Vasquez. Well, thank you all. Thank you for sharing your practice with us, Dr. Bedora. What a fascinating practice it is, and with great potential to help veterans. Swimming on, it looks like we have shrimps in the house, or in the tank, excuse me. And Dr. Andrew Harris is here from the Lexington VA Medical Center presenting Surgical Interoperative Handoff Initiative, Standardization of Surgical Technician Handoffs Using the Shrimps Visual Cognitive Aid. All right, thank you. Today we're gonna to be doing a little robotic surgery. My name's Andrew Harris. My name's Tom. I'm gonna to be the scrub technician today helping you. That sounds great, Tom. Let's do some great surgery and help some veterans today. This surgery is going great. Tom, you are phenomenal. Hey, Tom, it's me, Sarah. You ready for your lunch break? <laughs> sounds great. See you in 30 minutes. All right, team, we're getting into a little bit of bleeding here. Change them up. You know what to do, Tom. Tom, change the needle drivers. Come on, we're bleeding. Let's get it done. Um, Dr. Harris, uh, I'm giving Tom lunch, and uh, I don't know where you put the needle drivers. Maybe they're in the, the bedside drape. What? You mean we don't have a standardized way to communicate information during staff changes? All right, so communication in the OR is not standard. This was brought to us by one of our wonderful operating room employees. I see you, Trish. We all see you. Thank you. And so we studied it, and in fact, only about 83% of the time were we actually doing a handoff. And what we were talking about was highly variable. Important items were only discussed, some of them 30%, some of them 50%, some of them 78%. We never knew what we were talking about. So we worked with our team to develop a standardized visual cognitive aid. We got our frontline stakeholders involved. We worked with our wonderful QI team. We came up with the acronym SHRIMPS. We didn't know we were submitting it to Shark Tank then, full disclosure. Uh, <laughs> And it really has all of the information in a very easy to follow format, so we make sure we convey the right information when we're taking care of veterans. I'm obviously being a little bit joking, but surgery obviously is very serious. And so we would print this off, put it up in the operating room, all right? The higher the bars are, the better. The Navy bars are where we were at before we started, so we were not doing very well. As you can see, not very standard, lots of variation. And these are items like, what are we looking at on the robot screen? Now, what, what piece of anatomy is that? What are we doing with this tissue we have on the table? Where are the needle drivers that are supposed to be on the back table? 
after implementation, which are the light blue and the gray bars, were almost perfect across the board. Much more standard, lots less variation. So really easy questions here is, do the veterans deserve higher liability care in the operating room? Yeah, of course. Do our staff deserve standardized communication tools to ease their workflows and enhance patient safety? Yes. All you gotta do is print, do some education, and shrimps. So, my question for the sharks, pretty simple, who wants some shrimp? <laughs> Thanks. Another amazing story told. Up next is Burdette Berger from Minneapolis VA Healthcare System, presenting the PAP Hub and Spoke program. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'd like to start today with a story about Michelle. Michelle was an Army veteran married with two children when she was diagnosed with stage three cervical cancer. Despite chemotherapy and radiation, Michelle did not overcome the odds, and she died at the age of 40, one year after being diagnosed with cervical cancer. And her wish was that we would share her story. So why does Michelle's story matter? What are the challenges involving cervical cancer screening? Well, in the United States, there are over 14,000 new cases of cervical cancer diagnosed every year, with over 4,000 women dying. Despite the fact that cervical cancer is almost 100% preventable with screening and vaccination. Also in 2019, the ASCCP guidelines for management were updated and they are very complex. Also in 2019, OIG found that 48% of facilities were failing to notify patients of their cervical cancer screening abnormal results within seven days. So our solution was to create a PAP hub and spoke model within Vision 23. In this model, the providers obtain PAP and HPV samples. The nurses compile a comprehensive cervical cancer screening history. Once the results are in, we follow the ASCCP guidelines for management and make the follow-up recommendations. We complete the results letters for follow-up and send those. And we also do monthly auditing and tracking for quality control. We do have data to support our work so far. We've had a 30% reduction in patients that are overdue for cervical cancer screening. 100% of our patients agree that the PAP Hub nurses are helpful, courteous, easy to talk to, and that they care about their health. We have 96% of our providers are satisfied with our process, with one provider even stating that it is one of the first systems encountered within the VA that actually unburdens the primary care team. We've had a 70% reduction in errors and incorrect follow-up recommendations. We are able to notify the patients within roughly 24 hours of their test results, and one of our sites has increased their timely abnormal results reporting by over 60%. We have also been the winners of the VA Women's Health Research Impact Award. So why choose our program? We've developed an innovative evidence-based care delivery model that has been implemented throughout Vision 23. We've had improved participation and timely results communication of abnormal test results. We have excellent patient and provider data to support our program. <clears throat> we want to thank everyone that has participated throughout Vision 23 to get us here today. They've been amazing to work with because our goal is to honor Michelle's dying wish that no other woman should die from cervical cancer. Thank you. Huge shout out to our Sharks and finalists today for their hard work. Let's get back to our pitches with our 10th finalist, Jennifer Marin from Vision 21, presenting One View, streamlining healthcare operations with a unified dashboard for multi-facility view alerts. All right, hello? Hello. All right. Let's go back. OK. <laughs> All right, take two. So the VA electronic health record silos patient information, meaning providers must log into each system where they provide care. 
This particularly impacts your busy telehealth providers. While they're busy focusing on patients at one site, they can be left blind to the needs of their other patients. When it's time to turn their attention to those patients, it's difficult to know where to start. Because of the siloed system, they always have just a partial view of things like labs that have been resulted, new consults that need to be addressed, or orders that need to be signed. In order to be more efficient, a provider may skip logging into a system where they don't have active patients. But this approach leaves gaps and may result in a missed view alert. That's concerning. So patient safety officers report that missed view alerts can lead to delayed care, near misses, and bad patient outcomes. And we know our patients deserve better, and so do our staff. And now you can bring them a better way. Our solution is the One View dashboard. In a single view requiring just a single sign-on, providers have, can see all view alerts for all patients. They have information on what needs to be done and where so they can prioritize care. OneView also enhances patient safety. One user reports multiple instances of being incorrectly alerted on abnormal results. They only saw these alerts because of the dashboard. So because of OneView, the correct providers were notified and the patients received more timely follow-up. So how can you bring OneView to your facilities? We have a product that's ready to scale, but do need help adding more providers. This will take 20 hours up front, and then zero to two hours per week to answer user questions or perform simple maintenance. You definitely get your return on investment. Across a vision, providers can easily save 20 hours every week with this streamlined system. So you can see our users just love this tool. It's been a game changer for them. It saves time and it can save lives. So partner with us and bring the benefits of One View to your staff and the veterans they care for. Thank you. Welcome back finalists for the Q&A portion with our shark panel. First of all, I'd like to say you all did a sand-tastic job. <laughs> um, so Dr. Vest, let's start with you and surviving sepsis. Um, from that perspective, can you um, tell us a little bit more about the staff acceptance of your program? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we knew that you know, I think all of our providers and everyone in this room feels overburdened by the amount of documentation we have to do in the medical record. And we knew that one of the biggest successes to, a, you know, passing this CEP 90 metric is, you know, very detailed documentation. So what we did was we asked the frontline staff, meaning the emergency room nurses, the ICU nurses, the emergency room physicians, ICU physicians, to actually create their template that they wanted. Right? So, you know, by getting that buy-in from those frontline providers, it really reduced the amount of, you know, resistance and the amount of um, barriers that sometimes can happen when an institution says, you have to, you know, implement this template and here's all the documentation that has to go with it. Fantastic. Thank you. My question, um, Dr. Vest, I mean, it sound, sounds like you have thought of everything. I wonder if you've thought of why wouldn't a facility want to do this? It looks like it's all in place. What would be the argument to say, we, we don't want to, or is there one? You know, I think that what happens is, is, you know, everyone leaves medical school, nursing school, pharmacy school, knowing how to manage patients with sepsis. You know, I think that you, you come out of it saying, I know what to do. I know how to take care of these patients. And I think that, you know, you lose out on this protocolized care that really ingrains this muscle memory. And so I, I really don't think there is an, there, to me, there's no reason why you shouldn't want to implement protocolized sepsis care. Um, you know, but I think some of the, re not resistance, but the inability of doing it is that I think we already know how to do it, right? And I think that's, that's kind of um, the disconnect. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bredore, for your pathology as a best practice. 
As I understand it, implementing your practice eliminates or reduces the, pa the pa pathology slides belonging to any one veteran being allowed on the desktop around the microscope at any one time. Yes, that's correct. Implementation of this wall-mounted bin sorting methodology for slide folder and handoff reduces the amount of error or transportation for slides. Uh, this will actually, I mean, uh, make the chance to have a mix-up of like zero. So it's not a just reduce, it's just to stop it. Uh, we've, I mean, you know, I've been doing like for this pathology for like I mean, 29 years, and I've seen a lot of mix-up. And uh, like sometimes they bring you a case to get your opinion. So, you know, you know for example, they show you a case. Hey, do you see the cell, that, you know, you know, the cell look bad, it look like cancer. Where? Oh, sorry, that's not the case. So, so this is like, you know, uh, so this is the only way that there is no chance, you know, to, to, yeah, to, to do the mix-up and which is far more common. Like I used to get, like before this the practice when we started it, which was in like July, I mean, 20, I mean, 22. I used to get calls like, from like providers, maybe three to four calls. I have a patient here came after eight weeks. Where is the diagnosis or what happened? So you go and check. Oh, I forget to order that, you know, you know, whatever the stain. So this also will help you because you know, like this pin is yellow, is for the pending. For example, this is for the consult. You could get back to it and will look at you and tells you pathologist, I'm here. So there is no way even to file a case and it gets, you know, so there was one case which before that, which was about some stomach biopsy for the, uh, uh, which was for the like, you know, uh, you know, which was like for the, like, I mean, like a stain for helicobacter. One year, uh, there was like missed by the, the pathologist and missed by the provider. And then, uh, and then upon follow up in one year, what happened to, to the stain? So this will fix this forever. Um, we, we've been uh, inspected by the Jake and stuff, and, uh, and there was a pathologist who's been doing this for like, I don't know how many years. And then he looked at those bins and said, well, what are these for? So we told him. Then he took his phone, started taking pictures, and said, I've been doing 26 years. How come I didn't think of this before? So this really like something which, which I believe that like, it should be in every department. And I want to ask you all of you, if you ever have a biopsy that's going to need some major surgery, you better call your, I mean, you better call and ask them to pull the slides just to make sure that is the case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Badura, thank you so much for pioneering a practice that seems simple at the yeah, beginning, just... but it really saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. So, to uh, Dr. Harris offered us all some shrimp, I believe. <laughs> so, um, the surgical intraoperative handoff initiative, right? So, my question for you uh, was first going to be, did you just come up with that because you knew we're in Shark Tank, but you answered that one already. Um, so, my, my real question then, you said this, there's a standardized list. My question to you is, does that list ever have to be recalibrated, reevaluated? What is the validation process that the list is still standard and valid? Yeah, I pre appreciate that question. You know, I think in quality improvement methodology, you have to make sure you have a sustainability plan and an auditing plan. And we are probably on PSA cycle 10, 12, 13 by now. And we continually audit it and see if there's things we need to add. And interestingly enough, we found out as we were going through that the surgeons wanted to be involved. And there are certain parts of cases where we, as surgeons, would like them not to switch if it's in the middle of a key part of the case. And we weren't communicating that well in shrimps, and so now we've changed a little bit to it. Now we alert the surgeon. So yes, that opportunity does exist, but it only exists if we continue to watch it and continue to monitor. Thank you. Dr. Harris, thank you for your pitch. What do you foresee as the biggest barrier to implementing this practice across other facilities? Yeah, that's a great question. That, I think it depends on how you spin it. So if we spin it as we're telling people what to do, they're not going to do it. And that's not really why we did it. We wanted to offer our OR staff, based on their concerns, an opportunity to communicate effectively with one another. Now, it may not need, the, it may not need to be shrimps every place. Like maybe it's something different based on what their needs are. But I think making sure it's communicating and offering a way to have standardized communication so that the new scrub tech feels safe asking questions, or even the seasoned scrub tech feels not embarrassed to ask questions if a case maybe they haven't been in that often, and really tailoring it to the specific institution. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, switching gears, Ms. Berger, your PAP Hub and Spoke program. So tell us a little bit more about some of the difficulties that you encountered while implementing. Um, one of the difficulties is the buy-in. Um, you know, providers like to have their own practice, but also we found that sometimes they don't do very many PAPs, and so in some of our um, evaluations, we found that there were some errors made, and, and so now we really, um, I, I think our successes and, and people really realizing that we are there to help and that we are there to support their practice and we can take some of the burden away from them and they don't have to go through the algorithm and do all the chart searching and all of the things. So we've been able to really prove that we can help and now we've got people that just really want to jump on board. Thank you. I'm really excited about your practice for a number of reasons and mainly one around health equity. Mm -hmm. And you're probably aware that African American women are twice as likely yes. to to die um, yes. from cervical cancer. Yes. Um, so my, my question to you is around your communication strategy. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that our women veterans, all women veterans, are aware of what's happening and actually just come in and become part of our program so that they are getting these routine screenings? Right, and, and that's, that's a great question. So um, we do really work we actually call each veteran with results and we communicate with them directly because our, we are finding that veterans also have a high risk of abnormal PAP results. And so we do, um, once the results are in, we actually call them before we write our notes and do our things so that we make sure that they um, have the information and they have an opportunity to ask questions of someone about what their abnormal results mean. And then our nurses, if they have a little bit of downtime, they try and go through that overdue cervical cancer screening list and reach out to those veterans to bring them in so that they don't fall through the cracks. Thank you. Our last finalist of this group, Jennifer Marin with One View. My first question is, where have you been all my VA life? <laughs> uh, my second is, is more of a, a question related to, how do you foresee One View interacting with existing VA programming such as VA Video Connect, Virtual Care Manager, some of the existing platforms. Do you see that as a feasible integration? Um, well, thank you for the compliment. Appreciate that. And that's a great question. Um, I think that is a challenge we have with VA, where we have so many great systems, but do they really interconnect? And unfortunately, I, I don't see a way right now, perhaps if we partner and maybe learn more about some of those other systems, it may be possible. Um, but at this point, um, I'm not sure how the two, or you know, these multiple systems may work together. Thank you. All right, and thank you very much. I agree, where have you been? Um, <laughs> but from that perspective, where are you actually pulling the data from? Is it a CDW? What, where's the report source and how real time is it? Great question. So yes, this data is in the CDW, and it's actually on a raw server. And so most production data is updated every 24 hours, but this is updated every hour. And so we have near real-time data to provide our staff with you know, near real-time data and actually, you know, um, something they can act on. Fantastic. Thank you. Back to you. <laughs> I think I can speak for our sharks when I say, well done. <laughs> what a great round of talent. Don't forget to explore more about these finalists on Diffusion Marketplace and vote for Pitch of the Day if they were your favorite. As a reminder, we will Pitch of the Day voting will close sh shortly after our third and final round of finalists. So make sure you're ready to vote. Before we get to our last round, Blaine, can you help us understand what happens after the pitches? Sure thing. Once finalists finish pitching, we'll bring everyone back on stage. We'll make our promising practice announcements and read out the bids received by those practices. We want to give our finalists time to consider the bids and consult with their teams at home. So we'll take their bid information with them after the event today. Diffusion of Excellence will share final bid decisions tomorrow, right back here in the auditorium at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> Let's see how the audience is feeling.
back tomorrow? Oh, I love a good sequel. Hey, what do you think is better? Sharknado, Sharknado 2 at the second one, Sharknado 3, oh, <laughs> no. Oh, I didn't even get to global, uh, Shark Sharknado 5, global swarming. Well, anyways, we have some excited swimmers in the fishbowl. I am here with Dr. Deirdre Quinn. Who is ready for some trivia? I am ready, swimming in from BA Pittsburgh. Okay, when will the promising practices choose their bids? Ooh, I know that one. That is tomorrow in this room at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Excellent, you were paying attention. Join us live or float back into our virtual stream tomorrow. We will bring our 10 promising practices back on stage to announce the winning shark bits. Let's cast the line back to our hosts for our third and final round of pitches. I love trivia. <laughs> Me too. And those puns were spot on, Amber. The final round of innovations align with two priorities, prevent veteran suicide and support veterans whole health, their caregivers and survivors. To kick off our last round of pitches, we have Amy Tomto from Asheville VA Medical Center with Therapeutic Carbohydrate Reduction, TCR Aspire, a whole health approach to improving metabolic outcomes in veterans. Well, hello everyone. It's an honor to be here with you today. I'm here to share with you a novel whole health approach to really shifting cardiometabolic outcomes. We know that diabetes in our country is equivalent to swimming with a lot of hungry sharks. Not a great thing. In 2017, it was estimated to cost our country $327 billion. And that number does not include the one and a half million veterans who pay the human costs by suffering through this condition and the future costs to the nearly three million veterans who currently have undiagnosed or pre-diabetes. Sadly, the standard of care that I've been a part of that has abounded over my 20 years as a VA dietitian has fallen short. I think of Mr. J, a Navy veteran who despite many years of diligent work with weight management programming, continued to increase his insulin doses quarterly. And I think of Ms. S, a Navy veteran with pre-diabetes whose knee surgery remained unscheduled due to stagnant weight. So this standard previous practice, right, the standard of care tells us that type two diabetes is irreversible and it's progressive. Novel therapies have proven that we can reverse cardiometabolic conditions like type two diabetes and TCR Aspire is primed to do just that. Thanks to this program, veterans are reducing their carbohydrates, increasing physical activity, managing their weights, deprescribing medications, and staying motivated by setting realistic goals that are tied to what matter to them most. Here's how we know it works. Cardiometabolic outcomes are improving. Hemoglobin A1Cs are dropping by an average of 0.75. Medications are reduced or eliminated, and an average weight of 6.4% is lost all while increasing the quality of life and the confidence of these veterans. Thanks to TCR, Mr. J has halved his insulin dose, and Ms. S is no longer pre-diabetic and has obtained that surgery. In our classes, it is not uncommon to hear, you have given me hope, or I have more energy than I've had in decades, and I need new pants because mine are falling down. You know, you may be wondering, why this therapeutic carbohydrate reduction? What, what makes it different from a carnivore, a keto, or a paleo approach? Well, that's simple. TCR is safe and it's sustainable. It allows veterans to continue to consume a wide variety of foods and they are doing it um, with consistency. We need you sharks. Um, to join our team. We will provide you the tools for success, but we need you to bring your team on board. Wow, what a splash. Keeping on track, the next finalist, Tracy Washington, comes to us from VA Central Ohio Healthcare System, pitching VIP, 
the Veterans Impact Project. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to start by telling you an inspirational story. Um, one day I decided to shadow one of our outreach social workers. And on this particular day, it was pouring down rain outside. We pulled our vehicle to the edge of a wooded area and got out. As we entered the woods, there was a clearing. And all around there were makeshift huts, tents, and even people sleeping on pallets. My colleague John alerted people that we were there by yelling VA outreach and asking everybody that we met if they were a veteran. Through the rain, a man said to us, I'm a veteran, or we heard a man's voice and he said, I'm a veteran. We looked behind us and he motioned for us and said, come in out the rain. We went into his hut, I'll call him Tim. And while John was talking to Tim, I noticed that he had a lot of books, a wide assortment of books, and I just remember being really impressed by that. But as John continued to talk to Tim, it became apparent quickly that Tim was not ready to come off the land or accept VA care. And I thought to myself, how can we help this veteran in the here and now? And the answer, we took baby steps. We used donated funds to purchase a sleeping bag so that at least Tim was comfortable and warm. He didn't trust us enough that day to take the next step to end his homelessness. But we had planted a seed of trust. Over time, I realized that these scenarios happen every single day. So I reached out to the VFW Ohio Charities and asked them if they would support this particular project. And without hesitation, they did. So they were the first organization to donate to the Veterans Impact Project. And since its inception, it's been changing the lives of the veterans that we serve in ways that, on the surface, may seem like small wins, but those small wins become major victories. Because when a veteran has food security and housing security, it helps to end their feelings of hopelessness and, and even suicidal ideation. In a nutshell, a veteran's care doesn't just end with the, us providing them a medical appointment. The Veterans Impact Project is supporting our veterans' whole health. The best part of it is you don't have to use facility funds. Remember Tim? He's now got VA housing. He's connected to VA care and housing for him and his books. Every VA has a Tim. Reach out to your CDCE team to find out how you can start a VIP fund at your site today. Thank you. All right, everyone. Don't forget to vote for your favorite pitch of the day. We are nearing the end here. Our 13th finalist is Christy Kemp from Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System presenting from resilient, or Resistance to Resilience, a Veterans Renewal with Ketamine. Good afternoon, everybody. I bet most of you here already know that th the 13th leading cause of death of our veterans is suicide. Most of you probably do not know that that is 16 veterans a day, and 35% of those veterans have a diagnosis of depression. We needed to find a better quality of life for them, so our team came up with the ketamine uh, for treatment-resistant depression. We have a veteran, a local veteran, we'll call her Susie. She had depression and anxiety so terribly bad that she could not complete a sentence or finish a thought. And she was a successful school teacher for that. After only six ketamine treatments, 50% decrease in her depressive symptoms and denied any suicidal thoughts. 
She has done uh, with some of her therapy artwork, gotten back to that. We have it hanging in our clinic in Little Rock. And she's now a hospital chaplain. How many of you know somebody with depression, depressive thoughts, hopelessness? Well, ketamine pr proves to be a solid answer. It decreases the symptoms of depression. We've had a 50% overall decrease of uh, suicidal thinking and thoughts, and it even decreases anxiety, giving an overall better quality of life to our veterans. It's also a money saver for the VA. The cost for 1,000 ketamine treatments in-house is approximately $30,000 versus $55,000 to outsource it to the private sector. The VA cost for S-ketamine, or Spravato, per veteran per year in-house is approximately $16,000 versus $31,000 to outsource to the private sector. What does it take, you ask? It takes a designated space with recliners, equipment, staff that includes pharmacy, psychiatry, and nursing, and the time to uh, uh, for the astounding treatment to help these veterans. How many of you out there are ready to help these folks? Thank you. <laughs> Let's hear from our 14th finalist, Michael Rogers from Vision 15, presenting Suicide Risk Screen, Follow-Up Monitor. Every 12 minutes, a person dies by suicide, making suicide the 10th leading cause of death among Americans. While veterans account for 18% of adult suicide, they only comprise 9% of our adult population. Suicide Prevention Coordinators, SPCs, ensure veterans get connected with the care and support they've earned. Here is one veteran story. A 21-year-old female veteran presented for her initial primary care appointment where the nurse administered the suicide risk cream, which was positive. Due to multiple factors, the standard process for completing the Comprehensive Suicide Risk Evaluation, CSRE, follow-up was not completed. Alerted to the unresolved positive screen, the SPC reached out to the social worker she met a veteran who had a history of childhood and military trauma that was chronically stressed due to personal issues. The veteran also had access to lethal means and recently attempted suicide. As a result of this evaluation, the veteran's chart was flagged as high risk for suicide, and she will receive the enhanced mental health services to safely see her through this crisis. The social worker stated, I never would have known to reach out to her if you had not contacted me. Now imagine yourself as a social worker at your facility where this veteran leaves without receiving follow-up support. Despite widespread education, adherence to timely CSRE follow-up remained inconsistent. Consequences of a missed opportunity may be as minor as lowering a metric or as tragic as losing a life. Suicide prevention team members needed a way to be alerted to a positive screen when they occurred to act as a safety net for our clinical staff. The suicide risk group follow-up monitor is the solution available for activation at your facility today. A CPRS pop-up alerts the suicide prevention team members that one or more patients have screened positive for suicide risk in the past 36 hours and adds the patient to a real-time VISTA report. The VISTA report includes facility, patient details, the date time screen, and the provider who completed the screen. In May of 2021, one year prior to implementation at the initial site, Eastern Kansas Healthcare System, the ECSRE1 metric adherence rate was 46%. After implementation of the monitor in May of 2022, they noted a 54% increase achieving a 100% follow-up completion rate and have maintained this adherence rate for 16 consecutive months. By July of 2022, VISM 15 had five facilities with a 100% follow-up rate, making VISM 15 the first in the nation to reach 90% completion rate. Safety net success. Now, I ask you, will you hold the safety net alongside us to save our nation's veterans? Thank you. 
And we are ready for our final pitch today, RAVE, reaching all veterans at every encounter, presented by Dr. David Wayend from VA Finger Lakes Healthcare System. This is you. This is your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your closest friend. Today, 17 veterans will complete suicide. The VAH has a mechanism for identifying veterans at risk for suicide. It's an annual suicide screening assessment tool. Let's talk about the other piece of the puzzle. The majority of providers are uncomfortable performing suicide screenings. They believe it belongs to mental health. This ties into the stigma and the belief that suicide screenings belong to mental health. As part of the solution, we developed what's called RAVE, reach every veteran at every encounter. With that, what we did was, we focused more on just the mental health clinics, but the other specialties, optometry, audiology, making every encounter a touch point for suicide screening. Utilizing RAVE, we're able to dramatically increase the suicide completion screening rate in our optometry clinic, whose established rate was a mere 3%. By focusing on promoting a culture that emphasized that suicide prevention is everyone's business, and there's no wrong door to suicide prevention. We focused on campaigning a community plan to all of our providers at every forum, at every meeting, to call to action, to capitalize at every encounter to finish and complete suicide screenings. Remember that optometry team we spoke of? Utilizing RAVE, they've been able to complete continuously 85 to 95% of those screenings. With the use of RAVE facility-wide, we've seen a dramatic increase in suicide screening completion rates as well. I would like to tell you a story that happened in our optometry clinic. One of our providers was finishing the suicide screening, and the veteran turned and said to him, I wish someone would ask my son these questions. He continued by saying, my son's a veteran. He lives in Texas. He's going through an extremely difficult time right now. He's lost his job, going through a divorce, and more importantly, no one's been able to get a hold of him. And I just know if someone reached out and asked him these questions, it would make a difference in his life. Our optometrist furnished that veteran with the necessary resources and assured him that someone would reach out to him, to his son. By raving, we at the VHA can reach new heights in preventing the tragedy of veteran suicide. Sharks, I ask you, are you ready to make suicide prevention everyone's business? Thank you. I'm glad I don't get to vote. I am stuck between a rock and a shark place. <laughs> Let's hear a round of applause for our finalists as they come back to chat with our sharks. Well, thank you all for your pitches, but let's start with um, Ms. Tomto. My, my question for you is, I know that as we were preparing for this and there was a change in a word that you felt very, very adamant about between restricted and reduction. Tell me why. Yes, yeah, so uh, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction is really when we're going to a place of ketosis. It's a, it's a very rigorous form of carbohydrate reduction, and it has its place. Um, however, reduction is simply that, right? We're guiding veterans in, in decreasing overall carbohydrates, but also improving the quality of those carbohydrates. At the end of the day, the majority of the veterans graduating from our program are eating 30 grams of carbohydrates a meal, which, which is really quite a varied healthy diet. And that's important to me because I, while I see the role in clinical care of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, we want this to be something veterans can maintain for the rest of their lives. And we want them to enjoy meals with their family and to really feel engaged in their treatment. Let's end this yo-yo dieting approach, right? And really find a space that veterans can live and grow and feel excited about their next meal. Thank you. Amy, you bring up a really great point. There are so many options available for diets. What is your secret sauce? Why does this work? Well, I think the reason it works is it's bringing mindful awareness to what the veterans are eating. 
And we're also using health coaches. I think that there's something magic, kudos to Loretta in the audience, about our health coaches and the way that they remind veterans to tune in, right? So if you're choosing from foods and you're noting that you were eating 10 red foods a day, and now you're swapping them out for yellow, which are complex healthy carbs, or more greens, which are lots of vegetables and healthy fats and proteins, you're bringing intention to your choices, and we're doing it in a kind, non-judgmental way, knowing that sometimes that slice of cake is darn well worth it. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, switching gears, Miss Washington. What a fantastic story that you told about Tim. And you mentioned that the VFW had hopped right on board. How many service organizations do you have on board now with your project? I couldn't tell you specifically, but quite a few. We've been able to sustain it uh, for about, it's about five years old now. And um, what happens is because we have in our arsenal, so to speak, lots of different stakeholders that are always looking to support veterans in different ways and more meaningful ways, we just present it to them. And we have even a quarterly roundtable meeting with all of our stakeholders and we presented it to them and people just started coming on board and it's just, they call us now and ask us what we need, so. Love how you put the veteran at the center for that VIP project, yes. thank you. That's really awesome. Thank you, Ms. Washington. And so CDC is the VA Center for Development and Civic Engagement that used to be voluntary service, right? Yes. And so my question for you is then, how do you suggest that the medical center, can anybody just do this? How do the program managers at new facilities that might want to adopt this, how do they go about finding those partners? Absolutely. I think the first stop is with your CDCE, formerly Voluntary Services Chief. They have lots of uh, stakeholders that they've already reached out to. And if you want to start the program, I would say start at your quarterly stakeholder VABS, VA Voluntary Services meeting, where all of these people are coming to ask and inquire about what they can do. Present it there and also involve your chief of care management and social work because the social workers are going to be the ones that are going to be the major users of that fund. Um, and once you start um, at that point um, with all of the stakeholders around the table, then it kind of takes off from there. And I'm also open to, to helping anyone with any kind of program guides and the way that we started it. Um, pretty turnkey. Thanks so much. Yes, ma'am. Christy, you presented on From Resistance to Resilience, a Veterans Renewal for Ketamine. During your presentation, you highlighted the availability of both ketamine and esketamine. Thank you for identifying that ketamine and esketamine are two options, given the known shortage of ketamine. Predicting barriers for long-term scale and implementation will be crucial in your success of your project. What other barriers do you anticipate? We're starting all of our veterans with esketamine that are new to the program. And saving the stocks that we have for the people that already started on the IV and IM. So we'll be starting with Spravato and hopefully that we will get more ketamine in stock sooner than later. Fantastic. And what are, what are you actually using to, you mentioned you know, a significant reduction in uh, suicidal ideation. What are you using to measure that? We're using the PHQ-9 depression measurement tool and we study on number nine, which is suicidal ideation. We have data that backs up all of them and then specifically for the ninth one for wanting to harm themselves. Fantastic, thank you. Wonderful. So Michael, thank you for your presentation. Suicide risk screen follow-up monitor. Knowing how important this is in this screening tool, I, I still am gonna put on the lens of health equity on this one. And about the scale, how does the scale itself promote equity? Not only just for, for race and ethnicity, but LGBTQ plus, or how do we ensure that the right questions are being asked? Uh, the comprehensive suicide risk evaluation. Um, how do we, in, so the, those templates go through national approvals and 
and reviews and mental health, the Office of Mental Health Suicide Prevention are intimately involved in the development of these templates and materials and it's a interdisciplinary group that attends these approval groups to approve these for testing and then advancement. So I'm confident that through those mechanisms we continue to learn new things and create new updates to those to, to ensure that we're taking care of our veterans and getting the answers to the questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael, thank you for your willingness to include additional patient populations that weren't maybe initially a part of your pilot. Being flexible will serve you well long term. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, um, Dr. Oh, Wyatt. Out of time. <laughs> so talking about reaching all veterans at every encounter. Yes. Great goal. But what barriers did you experience when you were first implementing? What typically happened, the first barriers was we weren't identifying the patients that needed the screenings right away. It was laborious and it was horrible. We had to go through, we had to scrub our schedule every day to find out who was on the alert up for it. That doesn't happen anymore. We have a pop-up that comes right up. You go into CPRS, I'm seeing patient John, it comes right up on me. They need a suicide screening in a 30-day window. That eliminated that part of the issue. The other big issue was the change in culture and perception that you had to take suicide screening was everyone's business and prevention is everyone's business. Not mental health providers, you as an optometrist, an audiologist, a chiropractor, it's everyone's business across the floor. So when that pop-up comes in, you have to know how to do that and do it appropriately to the Columbia Suicide Screening Questionnaire. Now you can't just send out a test or an email saying, hey, it's in Teams, go through the screening, take the test, get your certificate, you know how to do it. That won't work. What we did to break down the barriers, which was very task specific was, we had one-on-one -on -one dialogue with our providers. We role played with our providers. After they had all the training, they knew what numbers to push, they knew how to bring up the Columbia suicide screens, they knew if the first the three questions were no, they moved on, it was great. The important and the most biggest part for them was, what happens if I get a positive screen? What do I do? I'm an eye doctor. I, I don't do mental health. Well, we gave them a, a cascade of numbers to call. And the most important thing was, you give a warm hand off to that patient. They don't leave, they don't go in the waiting room, you don't say someone's gonna pick you up. You call primary care mental health, they'll come down and take them, it's a warm hand off. And that's one of the biggest things we were proud of, that we put this in place. One of, our, one of our clinics did really well. So on our chief's call, they said, hey, how come this clinic's doing so well? And you guys, you know, your numbers are really pretty bad. So the competition started and they said, you know what? You really need to go one-on-one, -on -one, have the dialogue, and monitor it. And that's what we did, and that's how we were successful. And I'm extremely proud of the VA Finger Lakes for what they've done. Fantastic, thank you. Well, not done quite yet, but Oops. one last one. Oh, for sure. Well, thank you for, for your practice. And as you clicked on, this is your brother, your sister, your aunt. Yes. I have that story to tell in my family, so oh. what you're doing is very, very important. My question to you is what about, because we know that many of the veterans that do die by suicide, they are not VA patients. That's a great how question. We get, well, how we yes. how they, the eye yes. clinics in Yonah County are open clinics. They come in just for their eyes. They don't go through primary care. Yes. They don't go through mental health. But just like the veteran we had in that conversation, whose son was in Texas, we got him hooked up. You know he's going to go back to his his veteran service organizations and tell that story. So when he tells that story, someone in the next table will hear that and say, you know, I think we we have someone that needs some help. I didn't know they had that at the VA. They, we, I can get him that help the same way he got his son help. Well, I'm wondering just why not every, if it's everyone's business, then let's make it everyone's business. It, 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 so it, it why is. not out to our uh, well, non-VA providers when we're doing so much contract care? That, that's true, and I think that can lead on to it. But what I really found out was super um, mind-blowing for me was that when I started asking the, our, my patients these questions, they were saying, why are you asking me this? So we took a few seconds to say why we're doing it. We told them the number of suicides, and they go, that makes sense to me, you know? And they tested negative, but when we started this in our clinic in March, we've had six positives. 
the six people that would never have been screened never got help. And they had a warm handoff, every six of them. So I'm Thank really you. proud of that and my providers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's hear a round of applause for our fabulous shark panelists. Thank you so much. We are honored to have you join us. Blaine, these pitches were as fierce as the mighty tiger shark, but not quite as fierce as our outfits. Our finalists have some decisions to make tomorrow, but before they pick a winning bid, don't forget to choose from today by voting for the pitch of the day. Voting ends in the shake of a shark fin. That's now for those of us on dry land. You've already lost costume privileges. Don't push it. While everyone is getting their final votes in, we are now going to have all 15 finalists back on stage as we announce bids for our ninth cohort of promising practices. Remember, even if a finalist is not a promising practice, make sure you check out their Diffusion Market page for more information and bring them to your facility. All right, that's a wrap on Pitch of the Day voting. Let's hear it for the Director of Diffusion of Excellence, Blake Henderson. Thank you for sticking with us, everybody. Um, Let's give it one round of applause to all our finalists here. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say this has been a record year. Uh, we received 37 bids from 19 different facilities. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and announce each of our 10 Promising Practice, practice winners now. And if you hear the name of your practice, uh, please step forward to hear more about the bids. So first up, we have virtual waiting room from Pittsburgh VA Healthcare System, which receives seven bids from VA Eastern Colorado Healthcare System, North Florida South Georgia Veterans Health System, West Palm Beach VA Healthcare System, Central Alabama Healthcare System, Asheville, Louis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center, and James A. Haley Veterans Hospital in Tampa. So congratulations. Our next promising practice is Therapeutic Carbohydrate Reduction Aspire, a whole health approach to improving metabolic outcomes in veterans from Asheville VA Medical Center, which reeled in five bids. These bids come from Orlando VA Medical Center, Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System, Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System, Southern Arizona VA Healthcare System, and West Palm Beach VA Healthcare System. Congratulations. The third 2023 promising practice is Surviving Sepsis 90 Campaign HRO Saves Lives from James J. Peters VA Medical Center. You received five bids. Congratulations. From Memphis VA Medical Center, Dayton VA Medical Center, Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System, Boston Healthcare Center, and Pittsburgh Healthcare System. Well done. Next up, we have Suicide Risk Screen Follow-Up Monitor from Vision 15 VA Heartland Network. You received five bids as well from Nevada Healthcare System, VA Ileana Healthcare System, North Florida South Georgia Veterans Healthcare System, VA Boston Healthcare Center, and Sonny Montgomery VA Medical Center. Congratulations. The next promising practice is VIP, the Veterans Impact Project. From VA Central Ohio Healthcare System, this project received three bids from Memphis VA Medical Center, Central Alabama Healthcare System, and Sonny Montgomery VA Medical Center. Well done. The next practice also received three bids Ravy, reaching all veterans at every encounter from VA Finger Lakes VA Healthcare System. Your three bids are from Memphis VA Medical Center, VA Ileana Healthcare System, VA Boston Healthcare Center. 
Now, OneView connecting alerts from anywhere and everywhere from Vision 21. <laughs> VA Sierra Pacific Network reeled in two bids coming from VACO's National Clinical Resource Hub leadership team. The first time we've had a, a clinical resource hub bid on a practice, well done. And Pittsburgh Healthcare System. Our next practice is Scouts, supporting community outpatient urgent care and telehealth services from Louis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center. You receive two bids. The first is from Pittsburgh Healthcare System, and the next is from Dayton VA Medical Center. Congrats. Next up, we have Surgical Intraoperative Handoff Initiative, or how could we forget shrimps? From Lexington VA Hospital, which received two bids from Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System and Florida South Georgia Veterans Health System. Next up, from Resistance to Resilience, a veteran's renewal with ketamine from Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System, which received one bid from Cincinnati VA Medical Center. Please congratulate with me all the 2023 VHA Shark Tank promising practices, and don't forget to check out all our finalists on Diffusion Marketplace or reach out to them directly to learn about the amazing work they are doing for others. All right, I love the standing ovation. Wait, wait, wait we may have one, one more part of the uh, program here. And finally, our pitch of the day. Hey, where'd you come from? I think that's for you. All right, I hope so. I've been told different things. Finally. Our pitch of the day goes to PAP Hub and Spoke Program. <laughs> Woo! Well done. And so that completes our program for today. Please give one last round of applause to everybody up on this stage. And thank you so much for sticking with us through this ninth Shark Tank competition. Viewers, don't forget to join us tomorrow live in the auditorium or virtually through the Whova app at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time to learn our Promising Practices winning bid decisions. These are the facilities that Promising Practices will work with to implement their practice in their next exciting step with Diffusion of Excellence. I can't wait to see what bids they choose. Me too, and congratulations to our Pitch of the Day winner. Sounds like you make -oed the audience really excited with the presentation you gave to now. And now, let's celebrate with the dancing sharks. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Break it down. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Break it down. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. From the Diffusion team, we want to thank you, thank all of our sharks and our fighters. Can't wait to see you again next year. Hang loose. There go. It is great to be back up here uh, to announce the winning bid selections for our ninth annual Shark Tank competition. Um, as a general refresher, we had 355 submissions in this cycle. We then resulted in 100 semifinalists, and then finally 15 finalists that presented yesterday. We also had a record number of bids. We had 37 bids from 19 different facilities. And so between the competition yesterday, when we announced 
the Promising Practice winners, and today, each of those Promising Practice winners had an opportunity to review those bids and figure out which site really made, makes sense for them in this next, next stage of the journey. Before we announce these bid selections, I do want to ask each of our 15 finalists to stand up, if you're in the room. Um, you, all, you, you, all do, you all did something yesterday. You all did something yesterday that I like to remind everybody I've never done, many of you all haven't done, and that is stand in front of a very large group of your peers and share something beautiful that you have created and be judged. And I just really appreciate everything you do. Please come Thank you. All right. So on to the winning bid selections. We're going to start off with Therapeutic Carbohydrate Reduction Aspire from Asheville VA Medical Center. Can you stand up as I, as I call your name, please? And then we're going to have anybody from the winning sites, if you want to stand up and also be recognized, that would be great. You are going to Orlando VA Medical Center to hang out with Mr. Tim Cook and his wonderful team. And maybe you'll get some time at SimLearn Center, if you're lucky, or SimVet. Next up, we have virtual waiting room from VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System with, I think, seven bids to choose from is going to be going to North Florida, South Georgia Veteran Health System. Congratulations. <laughs> Next up, RAVE, Reaching Veterans at Every Encounter from VA Finger Lakes Healthcare System. We'll be working with VA Boston Healthcare. One View Connecting Alerts from Anywhere and Everywhere from Vision 21 VA Sierra Pacific Network will be going to work with, wherever the heck we can find them, VACO's <laughs> National Clinical Resource Hub leadership team. They, they could be anywhere, folks. They could be anywhere. Uh, Scouts, supporting community outpatient urgent care and telehealth services from Louis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center will be going down the road to work with, with VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System and, and Don, Don Koenig's wonderful team there, there in VA Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh man, that's great. All right, shrimps. Surgical Intraoperative Handoff Initiative, Standardization of Surgical Technician Handoffs Using the Shrimps Visual Cognitive Aid from Lexington VA, VA Hospital will be going to Gulf Coast Veterans Healthcare System. From Resistance to Resilience, a Veterans Renewal with Ketamine from Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System We'll be working with Cincinnati VA Medical Center. Congratulations. <laughs> Surviving Sepsis 90, HRO Saves Lives from James J. Peters VA Medical Center in the Bronx will also be going down the road to work with VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, Veterans Impact Pro Project, or VIP, from VA Central Ohio Healthcare System will be working with Jackson, Mississippi, GV Sonny Montgomery VA Medical Center. <laughs> Last but not least, Suicide Risk Screen Follow-Up Monitor from Vision 15 VA Heartland Network will be going to work with Sierra Nevada Healthcare System. Congratulations. <laughs> And that completes all of our promising practice bid selections. Please join us next year for our 10th competition. It's been a great ride. Thank you so much.